Hello. Should they start or? Yeah, it's one life. Yeah, should they start or you want to sense, say something first? And then start off. Okay. <laughs> yeah. start. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you well. Uh, do you want to first say something or I just jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with the basic introduction. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I think we are live now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to each one of you. I hope you all are healthy and having a great learning time at the Deep Learning Bootcamp. For those unattended, we at DeFi have been running a Deep Learning Bootcamp, joined over by 3,000 plus learners. And kudos to all of them for putting their best efforts so far in learning, brushing up their skills, and helping each other throughout their learning journeys across all the community channels. Uh, our today's session is a part of the Deep Learning Bootcamp. Uh, and in this session, we'll be learning about image classification using Keras and much more beyond it. And uh, for this session, we have our very special friend today joining us uh, from Berlin, uh, LXC. Uh, our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to him for taking out, out his time for the session. I'm sure like most of you would already know him, uh, attended his sessions in the past. Uh, but for those unattended, uh, Alexi is the founder of datatops.club and uh, is currently working as principal data sci scientist at OLX Group Berlin. His contributions to the community and open education in data science are invaluable and he keeps continuing to support many data enthusiasts uh, through his sessions, tutorials and regular updates over LinkedIn and other community channels. Once again, Alexi, thank you for joining us today. And without further ado, I let you take over the session. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and thanks for uh, such Once a great. Again, thank, you. Uh, thank you for such a great introduction. So I think I can just start. No, host disabled participant screen sharing. I think you need to fix that. Yeah, you can start off. Maybe, yes. Uh... You need to give the permissions. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just uh, while waiting for uh, the permissions. So thanks a lot for having me today for uh, um, such uh, warm words. And uh, today we will talk about image classification. Um, with uh, Keras. Um, so I don't uh, exactly know what exactly you covered in uh, the bootcamp. Um, but what we will do today is uh, we will get uh, a model, we will train a model for classifying images of clothes. So imagine that you, uh, let's say we can imagine a situation where we have some sort of e-commerce uh, company so we are selling different clothes. And uh, yeah, let's say not clothes, uh, not uh, e-commerce, but the marketplace. So where you can sell different clothes or you can buy different clothes. And uh, we want to develop a model that says if somebody uploads an image of clothes, image of pants or image of boots, image of, um, I don't know, jacket, we want to build a model that says, okay, here's a jacket, uh, it's an image of a jacket or it's an image of boots. It's an image of a dress. So this is the model we want to build. And uh, we will use Keras for that. Um, let me see if I can already share my screen. I can. Yeah, that's me. I'm looking at uh, this video. So let me just uh, go here. This is the plan for today. So this, um, uh, this, uh, workshop today is actually a part of a bigger workshop that I called end-to-end -end deep learning. And I already did the second part of this workshop here at the DeFi uh, a while ago. So the, where we took a model, a Keras model, and deployed it with TensorFlow, Lite, and uh, AWS Lambda. So maybe uh, you can find a link to this and post this to, to the channel for those who want to watch it uh, later. But that was the second part. The part was about uh, actually getting, taking a model and deploying it. And what we will do today is we will take the first part. We will look at how we can actually train a model that we deployed in a previous session. So what we will do today, so this is our plan. Uh, 
This is what we will use, do today. So first, we will take a look at the data set with uh, images of clothes that we have. And we will train a small, a simple small model using these images. Then we will try to tune this model to make it more complex uh, at different things like dropout and image augmentation. For those who don't know about this, maybe I'll quickly mention uh, what uh, this is. And then at the end, we will see how to make this model like how to use this model to make predictions, simple predictions. And the next step after that will be productionizing the model. And as I mentioned, this is something that we covered previously. And this end to end uh, deep learning workshop is a part of another bigger thing, which is uh, uh, the book I wrote. So this book is called Machine Learning Bootcamp. Book Camp. So this is a book about machine learning uh, for those uh, who uh, want to learn how to do this. And uh, yeah, so just uh, a couple of chapters there about neural networks and serverless uh, deep learning, which form this end to end uh, workshop. And if you're interested in machine learning, uh, you can check this out. Um, there is, a, yeah, you can find if you just Google machine learning book camp, you'll find this. And actually, I have an announcement that based on the book, I plan to run a free uh, online course on machine learning called machine learning zoom camp it's based on the book but it's completely free so you don't need a book for that and the content is same plus some exercises so the course uh, will run it's in september and uh, so here is the description of this course so we will cover exactly that and uh, the session we have today actually about neural nets and deep learning is one of the, the lessons there so there is a link in, this, in description that you can use for uh for registering there, so you can find it and uh, put your email and then you will get a notification when the course starts. Uh, and finally, I would like to invite you to Data Talks Club, which is an amazing community of uh, people who love data. Uh, it's a Slack community where uh, one of the channels here actually is ML Zoom Camp, where we'll talk about the course. So I am done with the announcement and let's just click Opera and Let's start. So the first point we have for today is exploring the closest data set. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, there is a data set with images and we we'll want to build a model for classifying images, uh, different images. So this is how this data set looks like. So let me just enlarge it a little bit. So you see we have um, different images of clothes. So we have pants, we have um, shirts, we have uh, I don't know, jackets, uh, uh, hoodies, uh, long sleeves like uh, hats, uh, uh, shoes, all different types of images now of clothes, yes. And uh, so the, the data set is called clothing data set, um, which is a data set I uh, curated, I collected from different people who sent me their images of clothes. So we collected at the end 5,000 different images. We will use a subset of this data set uh, we will not use all 500 or 5,000. We will use this um, only 4,000 with the top 10 most popular classes. So the classes here we have um, like um, uh, t-shirt, uh, long sleeve, um, boots, and so on. So this is the data set we use. And we see that it already has, uh, we already have a split into train validation and test. And if we go, let's say, to here to train to see the, the structure of this data set. So we have 10 different classes. So this is what we want to predict. And yeah, if we go to, I don't know, head, then we have these images. And yeah, so each file here is an image of uh, some clothing item. This is what we will use today for training our classifier. Uh, yeah, so. Now let's start. Um, so for this, um, for today's uh, workshop, I'll use um, AWS uh, Amazon SageMaker. So because it has uh, GPUs. So for those who also use, uh, this can work on any environment. So for me, it's just, I don't have a machine with GPU, so I rent this in the cloud. So for those who also want to do something similar, you can go to AWS uh, Amazon SageMaker, and then there is a section with notebooks. And you can start, you can request a notebook with this type of instance. It's called ML P2X large. And P2 here means that it's a machine with a GPU. I don't remember exactly what P2 stands for. 
like performance, I guess. So basically P stands for performance. So you want a machine with a GPU, and this is the type of the machine that you use. Uh, I already started the, the notebook. So yeah, so now I am in the notebook. I already have this clothing data set that I showed you previously, where it is, I think I closed it. Um, I already have it cloned and we can just start building our model. So first we need to uh, create a, a notebook. So if you use AWS HMaker as me, there are many, many different types of environment. So what we need is because we use Keras and Keras comes uh, with TensorFlow point, uh, two point something, we want to use this environment. So it's uh, the environment is called Konza TensorFlow 2. Two is important because we have TensorFlow just uh, without two and uh, uh, P36, which means uh, Python 3.6. It's a bit outdated, so like now uh, people use 3.7, Python 3.7 or 3.8, I think in some cases, but for us it doesn't really matter. So the important thing is that it uh, uses tensor, it has TensorFlow, tensor, and uh, yeah, we can use it. So let's quickly check that it indeed has TensorFlow 0.2. TensorFlow as uh, tf and we can quickly check on the version the version okay it takes uh, it's always like it takes some time to do the first import yeah in the meantime i can import other packages i will hope that it actually does uh, load the uh, version 2 of tensorflow and let me also uh, the load the usual suspects import mat plot leap is so yeah we see that the version of tensorflow is 2.1.3 which is not the most up-to-date version but this is fine for us and um, amazon um, they're a bit slow with updating the the kernels they have but this is fine uh, we don't need uh, like a fancy um, you know, like a, the latest version so this version is fine so next uh, as i said we use uh, keras for that keras now lives inside uh, tensorflow so we just need uh, to I import this tensorflow import keras so we have keras and uh, yeah so now what we need to do is uh, let's first just take a look at the images we have so uh, for that in uh, keras we have a special uh, keras special function preprocessing images so they, they have a package image that contains all the stuff we need for images and then there is a special function called load image so this uh, this function helps us load images um, so we'll look at uh, let's say uh, train data set t-shirt we'll take a look at the t-shirt and I don't know, let's take um, which one I want to take. Uh, let's take this one. So, so what we want to do now is uh, use this image, um, load image. Yeah, and we have uh, the t shirt that uh, I personally took this picture. So, you see, it looks, this is a t shirt I got from my work. So, in this picture I took. <laughs> Yeah, so this is how we load images in Keras using this load image. And actually, when we load, we can specify the size of the image. And usually, uh, if you remember that for neural nets, I think you had a lesson uh, about neural nets, that you need to have these images of a certain size. So let's say some neural nets that we will use today, we'll use ResNet. So they require images to be of size 299 by 299. So we need to resize our image, and this is how you do this. Get us, so it kind of becomes square now. And uh, yeah, so this is how we load images. Um, and uh, yeah, so now let's use, uh, let's train a neural network for that. Um, yeah, so first of all, 
continuous application. So in Keras, uh, you know that, uh, like in general, in deep learning, you don't usually train from scratch, right? So you use some pre-trained uh, model and uh, you apply so-called transfer learning for, well, for, learning, for training your model. So in Keras, uh, we have already a lot of uh, pre-trained model. So you see, like they are all to, all trained on ImageNet. ImageNet is a special is a data set with a lot of different images. So all these models that we have available in Keras, they are usually trained on ImageNet, and we can just take any of these models and uh, train them. Uh, use transfer learning, and by transfer learning, I mean that we take a model from here that is pre-trained, and uh, we uh, keep training a little bit this model on our new data set. So we'll take this model and we apply it to, we'll use the data with images uh, of course that we have. And later we will have uh, this model um, for doing classification. Uh, so we do this when we don't have a lot of data and we have only 4,000 images uh, in our data set. So yeah, we don't want to train from scratch and instead we'll train from, um, uh, we take uh, a good model already and just tune it a little bit. So um, yeah, I show you this Keras application. So there are a lot of different models. So we will use a model called exception. So is it? Yeah, the first one. So it's relatively small uh, in size. This is good. So we want to have small models. It's later when we deploy this model, uh, like the smaller the model uh, is, the faster it is for making predictions. So we want to pick something small, but reasonably accurate. And exception is, uh, like is a good, uh, like a good trade-off between size and accuracy. So it's only 88 uh, max, and it's quite accurate on, uh, on the image net data set. So we can take it. And uh, yeah, so this is how we do it. We just take from the TensorFlow, uh, Keras, uh, so there is a package called Keras Applications that contains all the models that uh, I showed you here. And we will use exception. So there is a package called exception in Keras Applications. And we need a class that is called exception. Yeah, this is what we need. And then, um, so when we put an image into a neural network, so we just don't take an image as this and put it, we need to do some pre-processing. So we take an image and do, uh, I will show you quickly now what we do exactly, but we need a function for that, that converts an image into something that a neural network expects. So we need that. Uh, so we need these two functions. And let me just uh, take this code that I have. So we'll uh, take an image, so I'll call it X. And actually first we will train, uh, I'll call it image. So we will first train a small model, which uh, doesn't take this large uh, input. It takes input only on of size uh, 150 by 150. And then uh, what, so we have this image, right? So it's a small image. Then what we do is we convert it uh, into a NumPy array using this simple thing. Uh, so now we see we have uh, like this is a two dimensional uh, NumPy array. So the dimensions are this uh, 150 by 150 by three. So three is the number of channels, red, green, red, uh, green, blue. Um, so we have this, right? And uh, usually when we put a model inside a neural net, we need, we don't just put one image, we put multiple. So what we need to do is actually uh, make a list uh, from this. So now, oops. Okay, just work like that. So here now what we have, we need to have a shape of one. Uh, it means we have only one image. Then we have uh, the size of the image, 150 by 150. And we have three channels. So the, the weird stuff I did here was to, to add this extra one at the beginning. So we have one image. Of course, if we have multiple images, then we, we can have all of them. Um, 
Yeah, so we have one image, and then what we do next is we invoke this function called preprocess input, right? And uh, if you remember how it looks like, so we have numbers between zero and two hundred forty-four, which means the um, uh, pixel for each uh, for each pixel we know the brightness of this pixel uh, for red, green, and blue channels, right? And then it basically shows how to display this image, uh, this pixel, this particular pixel. So what we will need now to do is invoke this preprocess input. And you see the output becomes uh, not a number from 0 to 100, uh, 254, but a number between one, I mean, minus 1 and 1. So this is the format that the neural network expects. So it doesn't expect a, uh, like this integer between 0 and 2, 255, 254, but it expects a real number between minus 1 and 1. So this is how the model was trained. And since we use a pre-trained model, we need to make sure that uh, the way we pre-process input is exactly the same as it was done when the, this model, the, the big model, was trained. So we need to use this pre-process input function. Uh, it's not very convenient to uh, to load all these uh, images by hand using this uh, load image function. So it's fine when we just need to load one or two or ten images. But if we want to uh, train a model and load all four thousand images, this is not convenient to to write a loop and do all that and manually uh, use this function. So for that, for iterating over the data. Uh, that we have uh, in uh, in our folders, we have a thing called uh, uh, image data generator. So it just looks at the folder, and from the folder structure, it infers uh, which images are there, which class they belong to. So we can just use that. So uh, they live in this uh, uh, this package TensorFlow Keras uh, preprocessing again image package. And the class we need is image data generator. So this class will help us to load images from disk. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, remember I showed you the structure. So in this structure, we have uh, three different folders. We have uh, train, test, uh, train validation, and test. So right now we need to get images from train. So let's create this image data generator. And uh, we need to use this uh, preprocess input function. So we tell now Keras that for every image you load, you need to use this um, uh, prepare input um, function. So we now have this uh, generator. And now, just and now from this generator, we create a data source. So we can just call it data source, train data source. Train generator will say that we want to generate images from. Okay, no way how to complete doesn't work because I made mistakes. So yeah, so we say that we want to load images from my directory. So we say flow from a directory. Then we need to specify um, the path. So for us, it's closing this so small train. Oh, not test train, sorry. Train. Um, then, uh, because it um, shuffles, so it takes images and then randomly shuffles all, all the images there and presents them in a randomized order. We want this order to be always the same. So if you take this code and run on your machine, you want to make sure that the images are loaded in the same order as on my machine. This is needed for reproducibility. You specify this parameter, seed, so it fixes the random seed and makes sure that uh, the randomization works the same way for me and for you. So we do that. Then um, we specify the target size. So this is the size of um, the images we have. So we will need a small, um, uh, small images. So the target size will be 150 by 150. And then finally, uh, we specify how many images we want in one batch. So remember, I showed you that we have, uh, like, we need to put multiple images in one uh, array. So this is uh, sort of a batch of size one. So there is just one image. But we will, at the same time, uh, load multiple images, 32 images at the same time. So this is the batch size. 
Okay, and it says, okay, I found 3,000 images in this train folder, folder that belongs to uh, 10 different classes. And we can quickly see what is there. So, because this is an iterator, if you know Python, that in iterator you can uh, invoke the next, uh, uh, how to say, element in sequence in uh, this iterator using this next, uh, um, next command, next function. And it returns uh, x and y. So it's first x is our uh, training data, our images. So the, it applied this preprocess input to in, to this x to the images, and y is our data. So here it's already uh, it already applied uh, one hot encoding scheme. So it's here one here means that uh, yeah for the class that. Uh, for corresponding class for the class number four, uh, or one, two, three, four. Yes, it's the, uh, an instance of this class. I don't remember what exactly is uh, here, but yeah, basically it already takes care of preparing the Y, the label data in the right form. So this is what Keras, uh, the kind of format it expects. So you see then this is, uh, let's say this is dresses, this is t-shirts. I don't really exactly remember what it is there, but yeah, basically for each class you have a one uh, in the corresponding column. Okay. And then you put this into a neural network for training. And I quickly show you how to do this. Um, before that, I think what we need to do is uh, something similar, but for validation. And remember that we need this, uh, we need to have validation data set to know how well our model is performing. So let me quickly create that as well. Um, so here, instead of um, now, yeah. instead of uh, train, we use validation, but uh, the rest is the same, I think. Yeah, so now it's a smaller, um, okay, just 341 images. Okay, now we have uh, training data, we have validation data. Now let's use a neural network to actually train this model. So we already did the import here, exception. So now let's... Uh, uh, let's load it. So we'll use exception. Um, then there are a couple of parameters. So the first parameter is weight, weights. So the weights is, uh, so you can get a model exception already with initialized weights. And remember, I was talking about transfer learning. So we, somebody with a lot of resources trained a model for us that we can reuse. And this is what we will do here. So we will reuse the model that somebody trained for us and for that we need to specify where the weights are coming from the weights are coming from ImageNet, so it means that the model is already pre-trained it's coming with weights um, and yeah it's possible to train this model from scratch as well uh, in this case you would need to, i don't remember what exactly you need to specify here uh, but something different i guess uh, random maybe um, so it will get a different model for you then uh, we need to specify the shape of the input. Um, so for us, uh, input. Sorry. Um, so for us, it's 150 by 150 by three. And then the last thing we need to do is specify the parameter include top. Um, and let me quickly explain uh, what it is. So, so let's say we have a. I hope it's visible. Just Yeah, so let's say we have a model that, uh, so this is a model, right? And uh, there is some, um, I think you studied convolutional neural nets. You know that there are some, a bunch of convolutional layers here that take like, uh, so first you have an image, uh, then this image goes to a neural network. Uh, and in neural networks, you have, uh, and in, in neural network, you have a bunch of convolutional layers. And uh, by the way, if, all I say doesn't make sense to you. Um, what I can recommend to do is check. Um, so let me just quickly stop uh, annotating. Check this CS224N. So this is a course from Stanford. Uh, I think I want to a different one. Yes. CS200231N. So this is a really great course on uh, the basics of uh, uh, neural networks on uh, deep learning. So they they basically um, 
talk about all this, like uh, what are the convolutional layers, what are the uh, pooling layers, and so on. I will not cover that in details here because here we have like more uh, practical approach uh, than uh, theoretical. But if you're looking for a good uh, theoretical foundation for that, in my opinion, this uh, this course CS231N from Stanford is the best one, at least the best one from once I took. And they have notes, course notes. And yeah, so I think they have, uh, um, yeah. So you can just go here, here, convolutional net, uh, networks. Um, you can see like, what are the convolutional layers? What are the pooling layers? Uh, what kind of layers are there? Uh, what is the architecture of a convolutional uh, uh, neural net? And things like this. So basically we take, a, existing uh, architecture so where's my yeah there are some convolutional layers there are some pooling layers right and then at the end you have this part so this part takes uh, uh, so this part with convolutional layers build some model representation so at the end you get some sort of vector form for each image so you take an image and you translate it into one dimensional numpy array or something like this. So there is some internal representation of an image, right? And then on top of that, you have so-called top or head. Uh, so this is like a head or a top of a neural network that takes this internal representation and finally arrives at the class, uh, um, like, is it a dog, is it a cat, or is it something like this? So here, when we say include top, we mean that we don't take that part. Right. So we take only the convolutional layers. So the layers that can take an image and convert them into some internal representation of an image. So it will be some sort of NumPy array, which later we can use to build our own top, to build our own head that will take this internal um, representation of an image that somebody trained for us. And then we can build our model on top of that. So here, that's why, so let me just clear that. So here, that's why we don't want to include top, because if we include top, then we will get predictions from ImageNet, which are classes like cats, dogs, cars, things like this. So they are not about loss. And we say that we don't want to have top. We just want to have the convolutional layers. And we will train something on top of that. And that what we want to say here also is that this model is not uh, trainable. So we will take these weights as is, and we will not attempt to train them because they are already good. And if we attempt to train them, we can simply ruin them. Um, yeah, so we want to take them as is. So we say uh, it's not trainable. So what the purpose of this line is to take this architecture exception that can use these convolutional layers that uh, it learned when training and extract the internal representation of an image, right? And then based on using that, we can train some other model on top of that. So this is our base model that can turn an image into uh, an umpire array, right? It's not trainable. Uh, now I think it will download the weights uh, because it's uh, the first time I run it here. I don't know. Um, so maybe it will download the weights now because uh, it actually needs to go to the internet and fetch, uh, fetch the actual weights. And then what we do is, as I said, we want to build something on top of that model. Um, so, yeah, so um, I don't know why it takes so long, but let me type uh, inputs. So now we input. Yeah, so now what we want to do is use this base model to build something on top of that. So first we specify the input. Oh, okay, fine. So yeah, first we specify, we say, this is the thing that uh, where our images will go in. So we say, um, keras input. So and we again say that uh, the uh, input, uh, the shape of our input is uh, this 150 by 150 by three. Um, so this is the input uh, to our neural network. Then we already have this base model, right? So um, we say that we want to take the base model and the base model will take the input from these inputs. So it will take the images coming from uh, 
this thing we specified here. And we don't want to train it. I don't know why we need to specify two times, but uh, for some reasons we do. So we need to specify that here it's not trainable, and then we are not going to train it. So uh, this base uh, model, what it gives uh, us is uh, uh, some sort of representation of, uh, of an image and actually in case of exception. So let me quickly draw it again. So we have uh, like this exception. Uh, so it gets in uh, like an image. Yeah, so it gets in an image and it returns uh, without top, it returns a two-dimensional array. So this is um, yeah, some array, I don't remember the size. So I don't know, X by X. Um, so what we need to do now is we actually need to take this two-dimensional array and turn it into one-dimensional array. The way we can do it can be very simple. We just take this array and let's say take the average of this column, take the average of this column, take the average of this column, and then so the average will take go here, then the average from this column will go here, and so on. It can be average or can be max value. So there are other like there are many different ways of doing this. So what we will do here is that we will take an average of each column here. So I'll call this vector. So vector is like our internal representation of an image. Um, so Skeras uh, Liars uh, Global Average Pool. And um, so our input is 2D. So that's why we need this global average pooling. And pooling here simply means that for each thing, for each column here, we take an average and put it here. So this is just a pooling is a fancy name of uh, for reducing something two-dimensional into one-dimensional. And uh, yeah, so this uh, syntax might be um, a bit confusing. So what we do here is first we create this uh, pooling layer and then we apply the pooling layer to our base, um, um, to the input we got previously. Uh, yeah, so this can be confusing. It's called uh, like functional um, syntax, but yeah. Um, it gets some time, like you need to to to, to spend some time to get used to this uh, syntax. But uh, yeah, if it's confusing, you can rewrite it like uh, pooling uh, function, and then you just invoke this as a function. So this is actually the same thing we did here with exception. So we first created exception and then applied it to inputs. So here we do the same. So we first create a pooling, func pooling function and then we apply, apply it to the base um, neural network. And then um, we get uh, this, uh, so output of this model uh, is a two dimensional thing and we get here a, a one dimensional thing. So, and uh, that's basically it. So we have this vector and now on top of, vector, of this vector, what we can do is we can um, uh, train, uh, we can have a dense layer. Layers dense. So a dense layer is uh, uh, just, uh, so where is my favorite? So now let's say we have this one dimensional vector that is coming here in vector. And what we do is we have a neural network, uh, let's say with some, uh, with some weights, weights that uh, combines them somehow, like and then uh, so like it looks okay. If uh, we have address, then we need to combine the inputs in such a way that we need to get the prediction for this, like here address, and then basically for each class we will have here an output neuron that combines the input in some way, right? So it means that we need 10 of them because we have 10 classes and each of them will get this uh, internal representation that we got from the base model and try to convert it into uh, the output. So what it means that we need uh, a dense layer of size 10 because we have 10 classes and it again has this uh, strange syntax that you first uh, create the thing and then you apply it to vector. And that's basically our model. So we take the base model, 
then we convert the two dimensional thing into one dimensional thing and we add one layer on top of that. So that's our model. And now we just need to connect the, uh, to put them into uh, like a special class called model. That uh, we can say that this is the input to our model and this is the output to our model. And yeah, I hope there are no mistakes. Yeah, so now we have a model. Um, yeah, which we can train. So we'll do this now. So for that, we need to specify the learning rate. And again, if this sounds like an alien language to you, you go to this um, uh, website, uh, the course website, CS 231 uh, n and you can read more about what is the learning rate, what is the uh, like different optimizers. But basically, uh, in a nutshell, this is the speed at which neural network learns. And uh, yeah, so we just say that uh, like it's uh, it's a parameter that we need to tune actually. So we need to, to try different values for that. And uh, now we just compile our model. We we'll say that. Uh, by compiling, I mean, uh, we just turn it into something trainable. Um, and then we say what exactly we want to use for training this model, what kind of optimizer. Um, so the, there are many different optimizers. Um, one we will be using here is um, Adam optimizer. Again, I will not go into details uh, what is it and how it works. Uh, and I would refer to the CS231 uh, for more details. but. Um, if you're not sure, Adam is usually the best choice. So go with Adam um, if you're not sure. And then Adam takes one parameter, which is the learning rate. And uh, then for a neural network, we need to specify a loss. So this is what the function, oh, the, the function we want to optimize. So in our case, since we have a multi-class problem, uh, we need, uh, so keras losses, we need a thing called categorical cross entropy. So when, when we have um, multiple categories, so when we have a multi-class uh, classification problem, then we need to use categorical class entropy. Uh, but otherwise, we can uh, just use log loss, for example, if I uh, can find it here. Uh, so anyways, so categorical cross entropy is this is what we need to use for multi-class problems. And there is a parameter called from the JITS, uh, uh, which means, so here we just take the output vector. Usually in a neural net, you also need to apply some sort of activation function uh, to actually to turn these values into mm, something else. So for, um, for neural nets at the end, you often use like an activation function. Activation, activation is a softmax. This is a special activation function that you use for um, multi-class um, problems. But yeah, here, instead of adding an activation layer, we can just say from logits, and it means that it uses a raw output of this. It doesn't apply any activation function. And again, I hope I didn't lose you here, uh, but if I did and uh, you can just follow uh, me along here, but you can refer for the theory part to this website that I mentioned. And then finally, we can also specify the metrics we care about here. In this case, it's accuracy. So we want to look at how accurate our model in terms of accuracy. Okay, we compiled the model and now we can just train it. So we use model uh, fit. And uh, remember, we already took, uh, we already had the generators, the data sets. So we use these data sets to actually train the model. Uh, we want to uh, train this model for 10 iterations. So one epoch uh, is uh, when we go over the entire data set once. Uh, so we want to go over the data set 10 times. And uh, uh, the validation data set that we use is uh, LBS. So this is how it looks like. So let's just quickly do this for one iteration. Yeah, I don't know, this thing uh, somehow appears on uh, AWS all the time. For my computer, it doesn't uh, appear. 
yeah it should be like the first uh, iteration might be a bit uh, the first time when it runs it might be a bit slow so when training a model so since we use the gpu now what i like doing is uh, looking at the terminal so if you use a um, jupyter notebook you can just create a terminal and uh, there is uh, a command in uh, nvidia um, yeah, I think that's it. So it's NVIDIA minus SMI, which shows you how utilized the neural, uh, the GPU is. So in, now it sees, uh, shows that, so probably the training started. Yeah, so it's already started. It shows how utilized the neural net is. So what I usually do is I just use this watch command that shows you um, the utilization. So now it's, uh, it's zero, right? So now the iteration uh, stopped. And this thing returns a history object. So you can actually see um, um, all these values like accuracy, uh, validation loss, validation accuracy uh, in this object. So what I usually do is uh, I write history. This is the result of, uh, uh, of this training. And uh, yeah, you can train, let's train it for nine iterations more. And then in this history object, we can get, uh, we can access all these things that are output here. So let's train it a bit more. And we can see like how accuracy improves. And this is training accuracy. This is not validation accuracy. So at the end of each iteration, it also reports validation accuracy. So we just need to wait a bit. So now it will do validation, yeah. So you see like it improves, like, uh, yeah, not really improves, so probably. Uh, yeah, maybe it will improve a few percent more, but uh, not significantly more. Yeah, so, and uh, we can see that the model is actually training. Well, uh, that GPU is utilized. Yeah, so uh, we can see like this number should be high. Like uh, when it's high, it means that our GPU is actually utilized. Yeah, so like it's, it will probably reach like 80 uh, or something like this. Um, and the problem with this approach is um, like, uh, we probably want to, yeah, you already see that here. Uh, let me stop it. So you already see that for iteration number four, um, yeah, the validation accuracy was actually less than for iteration number three. And, uh, but now, the weights we had on iteration number three were overwritten by the weights uh, from iteration number four. But we're interested in this model because it was actually better by, by continuing training, we made it worse. Right? So what we need to do is we want to actually uh, save this model. right? And for this, we use the concept of checkpoint. And I think I didn't, uh, yeah, I mentioned that uh, I forgot to say that learning rate is actually a parameter. And uh, you can try different ones. So I think when I was experimenting, the best learning rate was this one. So 0 0.001. But this is a parameter, and you need to experiment with this parameter to, um, to understand what is better. And uh, you try different values. So you can try 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, uh, different values, and then see on which uh, in which case the validation accuracy is best. And uh, yeah, so this is how you tune these parameters and this is how you in general approach training the model by trying different things and seeing what works best on um, validation. And uh, yeah, so as far as I remember for this data set, this learning rate was best. And uh, yeah, I mentioned now that we want to actually uh, preserve this uh, like the best uh, weight uh, instead of uh, you know overwriting it. And for this, uh, we use the concept of uh, checkpoints. So we we can just uh, you know save uh, save the best one. So for that, in Keras there is a concept called callbacks. So a callback is something that is invoked, uh, for example, after each epoch or before each epoch uh, that can do some things. So in our case, the callback we're interested in is a checkpointing callback that after each iteration looks at the validation accuracy. And if it's an improvement over the previous one, then it saves this. 
So let's use this. So we first create a list of callbacks because Keras can uh, uh, get not just one callback, but multiple. And we're interested in Keras callbacks uh, model checkpoint callback. So first thing we need to specify is the how the output files that it saves will look like. So we can just say it will look like exception. Uh, then we are interested in uh, the epoch. So what is the number of epoch that, uh, um, like on which the this accuracy was achieved? And again, so like here I used the Python way of formatting. So you can um, look it up. I think there's a, a nice uh, website called pyformat.info uh, that explains how actually uh, this formatting works. So one of the things I use now, you see is uh, this epochs, then colon, then 0.02D. Uh, it means that uh, you need to uh, have two digits with a leading zero and D means a digit. So yeah, so this is just a formatting option. Um, then next, we also in the file name, we want to have uh, validation accuracy. So here we have while accuracy. So we just want to use that. And we format it, let's say we only are interested in three digits. So we will use this option for formatting. And then the format of this is H5. So this is how Keras saves uh, weights internally. Um, the next thing we want to specify here is what we monitor. So we monitor validation accuracy. Um, so this is what we want to look at when deciding if we want to save the weights of the model or not. So this thing we want to see like, okay, when this validation accuracy improves, then we want to save it. Not when just accuracy improves or not when validation loss improves. We're interested in validation accuracy. That's why we need to say which kind of metrics we monitor. And then finally, mode equals max. It means that we're interested in maximizing accuracy. So uh, for example, when we are talking about loss, we're interested in minimizing loss. But in, term, in case of accuracy, we want to have as big an accuracy as possible. That's why we say max. So this is the checkpoint uh, we have. So let's, uh, I will compile this one more time with uh, like, a, no, actually I think, yeah. So I'll need to compile it one more time. And let me just uh, do this one more time to reset the, the weights from the previous uh, training. So now we just train from scratch again. So we'll take this line that we previously wrote, model fit uh, 10 epochs. Then we also want to save it into the history object. History. Um, and then as an extra parameter, as a fourth parameter, we want to specify here callbacks. And that's our callbacks that we have here. Yeah, and uh, that's actually what we all, everything we need to do now. So we uh, train again. So let's check that our GPU is utilized. Yeah, it is utilized. Yeah, you see, because we uh, used a smaller um, learning rate, so we added an extra zero there. It doesn't learn as fast as previous one, but at the end, it actually gives a better uh, accuracy. So here we have seventy-six. Uh, oh, yeah, it's actually yeah, it's actually better. Um, yeah, and uh, you see here, now we can check, we can go to our Jupyter node, we can see that we have new files here. So we have this exception, and we see the accuracy of this model. And here, like the second iteration was actually an improvement. That's why the model also saved this uh, as iteration uh, 0 0.2. Yeah, and uh, now it will train for, um, for 10 epochs. And we see that epoch number three was actually worse than epoch number two, right? So that's why if we go here, uh, uh, no, it saves everything. But there is option uh, to actually save only the best one. I think I forgot to specify here. There is one parameter that I didn't specify, save best only, true. And then in this case, it will save a model only if it's an improvement over the previous one. I think in this case, I didn't specify this parameter. That's why, yeah, basically on each iteration, it, uh, it saves it. And, well, but either way, it's good that we save each one because we can just, next time we use this model, we can just take this one, which is the best one and do not use the, the other ones. 
Okay. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about, I see that we don't have a lot of time, so let me just quickly do that as well. Um, so in this model that we created here, so I can just copy everything and, oops. So just put everything in one cell and then copy. Yeah, we want to train a new model. So here, this is just one, um, one output layer. So the base model gives us some vector representation, and then we immediately train a, train something on top of that to convert this um, this output of the base model to the predictions. But what we can do here is actually adding another another layer. So again, so we have uh, this base model. So the base model outputs uh, like a vector one-dimensional vector and then what uh, we did was that uh, you know we have the output layer that just combines the the values from here to make the prediction what we can do here is actually we can have another layer between them right so we take the intermediate like this vector representation then we have another layer here in between and then we have the final uh, layer with the decision. So this is something we can do now pretty quickly. So let's call it uh, inner layer. So it's uh, also a dense layer like previously. Uh, Keras uh, layers dense. And here we can specify any type, uh, like any size of the layer. So previously we had to specify 10 because we have 10 uh, classes, but here we can go with um, you know any value and then if you remember i talked about activation functions already so this is a way to add some non-linearity into the output of a neural network again i will not spend time on that and refer to the same website as previously but uh, relu is uh, uh, the best activation so i always use relu uh, like i almost always use adam i also always uh, use relu so these are just to go things and you don't need to think about this too much you just go with Trello all the time and then uh, yes yeah, so we have this inner layer that takes in a vector representation and then the output takes the uh, output from the inner layer and uh, yeah applies something um, yeah. so basically we get uh, we put one extra layer there so yeah we created a model and then we again uh, uh, can, uh, add a callback and uh, train it. So we can just, uh, this since it's a different type of model, which can just exception two or V2, uh, because we have one extra layer and we can train that as well for, yeah, I think I need to do that maybe. Uh, yeah, right. I didn't. Uh, I didn't compile it. Okay, so let me compile it as well. Okay, so I compiled. Now we can train the model. So I actually wanted to show uh, you a couple of more things. I see that we run out of time. So uh, I don't know. Do you have more time, or I should stop now? Okay, so I, like, I, th I think you can continue. I think uh, if yeah. you have some more things, I mean, like, you can feel free to continue. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering how many people still watch it. I hope you're not uh, bored. Yeah. I oh, think there are people. Hi, yeah. hi everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I still want to leave some questions for some time for questions. Uh, I think it's quite uh, a Anyways, yeah, so let me continue. Yeah. Oh, it's training now anyways, so I still want to keep some time for questions. So the next thing I want to do now is, uh, yeah, let me just stop training. So yeah, this is how we gradually improve our model. So now we can, uh, instead of 100, we can again play with, play with different um, uh, dimensionality of this inter internal layer. So for example, we can try to put 50 there, we can try to put 200 there, and then see what works best. Then another thing I wanted to show you is a thing called dropout. So dropout is uh, um, 
a way of uh, making sure your model doesn't uh, overfit. So let's say if we take uh, this image that we loaded here, and if we take this image and this neural network sees it 10 times, that it might learn that, uh, you know, if there is a logo of a leaks on, a t uh, on like a piece of clothes, then it must be a t-shirt. But this kind of rule is not really general generalizable, right? There can be a hoodie with a leaks logo or, I don't know, a backpack or something. Uh, but since uh, it sees, the model sees the same image 10 times, it may accidentally pick up these kind of rules that, uh, you know, doesn't generalize. Just because in this particular data set, there happened to be a t-shirt with this particular logo, it might think that, uh, you know, all things with this logo are t-shirt a priori, right? And for that, what we can do uh, to avoid that is um, uh, a concept called dropout that helps that, uh, you know, effectively what it does, it kind of, uh, 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 so it turns what we have, uh, like a new neural network turns our um, image into like one dimensional representation and maybe for this uh, logo here we have uh, i don't know something here or here right and then uh, when training based on that so now we have uh, uh, let's say the next um, the next layer and then uh, and the output so here, like for example, to calculate uh, this value here, what it's doing is taking the value from here, taking the value from here, basically from each element uh, and combines it in some way, right? So what we can do to uh, avoid overfitting is a pitch iteration, each time we uh, train, we just say, okay, we don't want to, uh, let's say train this one, this, uh, this value here. And that it means that all these nodes, that we, or all these connections that we have here, they are basically canceled. So during the iteration, a neural network doesn't look at them. And then it kind of makes, uh, so the way for a neural network at the end uh, is it feels like an image every time is slightly different. So maybe in effect, uh, what happens is like this part is missing in one of the iterations then uh, this part is missing in some other, uh, this part. Oh, I like it's uh, not exactly what happens, but this is like to, to give you some intuition that every time a model looks at an image, it gets a slightly different version of this image, right? So it tries to, for example, if you take and just hide this one, so then maybe during one iteration, it will not see a logo, right? And then maybe it will not see some other part. Uh, and then it will make it, um, it will force a neural network to focus on patterns that generalize, right? It will not focus on some specific local pattern. It will try to force the neural net to, uh, to focus on the, on the big shape, right? So that it has to be like a t-shirt, has to, to have uh, this sort of shape, right? Um, so it, it's uh, again, not completely 100% true, but uh, this is like to give you intuition what dropout is doing. Um, uh, like it, in reality, it's a bit more complex, but again, I refer to to this uh, CS200 uh, for like basically this uh, course for more details. Um, yeah, so let's add dropout. So for that, uh, we want to add dropout after this inner layer. So let's call it drop. And then I have keras layers uh, dropout. Yeah, dropout. Then. Um, uh, too bad I don't have this picture anymore with me uh, that I do here. So basically drop, so dropout layer can have some parameters. So one of the parameter is uh, how many uh, neurons, how many, uh, you know, these things we want to drop at one iteration. So we can drop only 10% of them or we can drop 50% of them, like how many sort of parts of the image we want to hide at every iteration. So this uh, is called drop rate or just rate. So yeah, we can go with, uh, I don't know, 0 0.2. So it means that 20% of the uh, of the previous layer will be hidden and the network will only consider the remaining 80% at each iteration. Okay, and then, so this uh, uh, drop out layer takes uh, this inner layer and then the output, uh, yeah. 
so output gets the values. Okay, something happened with my computer. Um, and so the output gets the, yeah, the input from the drop layer. And this is how we apply dropout, right? And again, you can experiment with different dropout rates, um, 0 0.2 or 0 0.5. And you see that if you put the value too high, like let's say if you put 0 0.8, then the model uh, maybe it's too hard to model to learn every, anything um, and yeah it's uh, it doesn't really learn well while if you put it too low then the model starts picking up on some patterns that do not necessarily exist like i don't know a logo on a t-shirt so yeah you want to experiment with this uh, 0 0.2 values between 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 usually best works best so you want to try a number of different things um, uh, before uh, you know finding the, the best version. Last thing, last thing I wanted to show you before finishing is uh, we trained a small model, right? So the input was uh, to uh, 150 by 150. Um, the the reason for doing this is because for small uh, images it's faster to train. Um, and uh, what I usually do is I first train a small model with small images. But once I find a good set of parameters, like if once I find a good architecture and then I find a good learning rate and I find a good uh, uh, dimensionality for inner layer and things like this, then what I do next is I increase the size and train a final model. So let's do that. Uh, so we have, uh, yeah, for that, I actually also need to adjust uh, this one. So here we say that, uh, uh, the target size is to 299 by 299, 299. So we we'll do the same here. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so we need to change it here as well, 299, and then the shape. So now we do this. And uh, yeah, now we have uh, uh, our final model. So that we can train for 10 iterations or more. Uh, what I also do is um, I often set this number to something big, like I don't know, 100, and uh, yeah, just watch what it's doing, right? And then uh, you can, like, if you see that the model is not performing well, you can just stop it and try to get a different parameter. Um, and yeah, but if it's doing fine, I just let it run for some time. Um, um, yeah, and the very last thing is I want to show you how to apply this model. So this model, uh, we didn't really finish training it, but I just want to show you how to apply it. So there is a thing called predict, right? And simply what you do is uh, you just give this, uh, um, yeah. So let's say we can take, our image here. So this image, uh, because the neural network expects an image in this shape, 299 by 299. And then, uh, yeah, and we need to also uh, pre-process this image, right? So we need to invoke this pre-process input. So this is how our input looks like. And we now can apply this to, uh, yeah, so it gives some predictions. I do not remember which of them is a t-shirt. Um, yeah, but this model is not trained uh, that well anyway. So it just didn't finish at least one epoch, but like after 10 epochs, uh, yeah, basically this is how you use it. And then of course, to make sense of this, uh, yeah, you need to know which, uh, uh, which particular uh, element uh, corresponds to which class. And uh, yeah, for that, uh, you need a map. I have a map somewhere here. Oops. No, wrong one. Uh, yeah, and by the way, so what I'm showing you is the code from the book, from Machine Learning Bootcamp. And everything I showed you and a lot more is available uh, in this repository. So you can just go there and it's chapter seven, uh, neural networks. And uh, you can see all the code uh, from the book uh, there. And yeah, so we have these labels here. This is how we convert the output of the model to, uh, 
like because th these numbers don't make much sense for us. Um, labels. Uh, yeah. So what we do want to do next uh, is uh, yeah. So this is let's say our predictions. Uh, I have predictions, and then um, the predictions um, for the first element they're here. Uh, this is how we can find out what is the um, uh, maximal value here. So it's nine, and nine is a t-shirt. Well, I'm surprised that the model got uh, got it right, but I think it's just a lucky coincidence. Mm, yeah, I think uh, it's all. I also wanted to cover dropout, uh, sorry, uh, augmentations. You can see how to use augmentations uh, uh, here as well. So if you go to this uh, train uh, notebook, you will see everything that I showed here. Uh, so with some graphs, um, yeah, like how to select the learning rate, you can go there and uh, look, on, uh, look how to do this. And uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of numbers. Uh, I'm curious, this uh, thing that I didn't manage to cover today is about data augmentation. How do you actually, um, uh, like how do you generate more data from the data set you have? Um, go check it out and uh, yeah, I guess uh, that's uh, that's it. I, I, I guess there are some questions I'm happy to answer them. Sorry for taking a bit longer than uh, than planned. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, Alex, for uh, taking such an insightful session. I'm sure like all the community members and learners who popped in today uh thoroughly enjoyed learning yet we have i think a couple of questions from people uh so one frequent question which uh, a couple of members asked is uh like what how could this problem be done sequentially and like you know maybe if you can share like you know the reason behind doing it functionally over sequentially uh, I, sorry i didn't get uh, the question yeah so the question was like you know how could this be done with the sequential in instead of like you know using the functional syntax ah okay well in uh oh i i would need to actually show now but uh, just google keras sequential and then you will see how to do this i don't think it's that different uh, and just by looking at the examples i think uh, it will be enough to to understand how to do this i uh, prefer this functional way um not because I particularly like it, just because it's more popular with the community and more examples are uh, in this format than in other format. That's why I tend to use this. So no particular reason, basically. And um, yeah, I think it's a bit easier. Um, so now when I think about this, I think it's a bit easier to actually do transfer learning with uh, this functional way. Um, yeah. But, um, most of the examples you will find on the internet are I like that. That's why, uh, yeah, this is how I learned it, and that's why I do do it this way. Got it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that insight. Uh, I think yeah, that's that's pretty much for the questions which we received uh, for the session in the chat. Yeah, in the chat we can probably end on the session. Uh, thank you everyone who tuned in for the session, and special mention to Harshita. Uh, for moderating uh, it on the back end and coordinating everything. She's one of our community members. And once again, Alexi, thank you for taking our time and like, you know, taking this session. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe last one last thing, if you enjoyed uh, this session, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm going to run a course uh, based on my book for free. And what I showed you is one of the modules of this course. So if you enjoyed uh, this, uh, please check it out. So there is a link in the description for the registration form. You can go there, leave your email, and when the course starts, uh, uh, I'll send you an email. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Alexi. Also, Alexi, I think there are a, a couple of questions which were already addressed, but I would like to ask them uh, just to know your perspective on it. Uh, so, for example, you used AWS SageMaker, right? Uh, just wanted to understand, is there any uh, specific um, preference there or like, you know, people can technically use Collab or Kaggle as well, right? Or wh what is the advantage that you see with uh, AWS SageMaker? Which reminds me that I need to stop my, <laughs> stop my instance now. <laughs>
So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I stopped it right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. so that's uh, I guess the the major okay. difference is uh, like in AWS, to um, make you pay for this. So now I spent like a cup like one bucks for sure, maybe a bit more, for uh, mm-hmm. one hour. Uh, for one hour, you you basically need to pay at least one dollar. Right. Well, while in collab, you do not. Um, mm-hmm. It's free. You know, on Kaggle, I think it's also free. You. Uh, you cannot abuse it because they give you like a, some sort of quota, how much uh, GPU hours hours you can get or something like this. I don't remember. Uh, so you don't like mine Bitcoin there. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I guess that's the main difference uh, that one is free, mm-hmm. the other is not. But mm-hmm. I like using SageMaker because it's a dedicated instance for you only. So mm-hmm. you get what you pay for, right? So it means mm-hmm. that... Um, like when I hit this model.fit, I know that the entire GPU will be used and they will not have to wait for, I don't know, uh, a week for the right. training to finish. While right. in collab, you don't have that guarantee. If you're yeah. just learning, mm-hmm. that is fine. Collab is mm-hmm. fine. Uh, mm-hmm. Just pick a smaller model, right? Pick an exception. Don't pick like... Uh, in, in Inception, there's not uh, version 3, which is like uh, a very big one, 500 megabytes, because right. it will take a lot of time to train it. So pick something yeah. small, pick a small image like we did here in this example, and then collab or Kaggle will be fine. But uh, yeah. yeah, if you are serious about, uh, uh, like if you want to train a bigger model or like at work, like uh, yeah, at work, mm-hmm. it's fine just to use SageMaker. And I use SageMaker at work, that's why for me, this is just uh, convenient. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I think this is the answer. I mean, like, I was just looking forward for it because uh, people end up uh, training on Collab and Kaggle and it takes yeah, a while. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, fine. it takes a while. For learning, think, it's the best. It's thing. fine. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. got it. Like, I, I and, know that not everyone has uh, uh, one mm-hmm. box to spare, right? I know that yeah. for some people, even yeah. that, like for students, yeah. uh, like, for example, in India, like not from Europe or the States, one box is... Uh, money mm-hmm. right and especially if yeah. it's uh, for students who do not earn money yet like for them yeah. maybe it's uh, so collab yeah. and uh, kaggle are just fine yeah got it got it thanks thanks a lot uh, for that uh, insights and i think that's pretty much it thanks thanks a lot uh, alexi and uh, have a great yeah. uh, rest of the evening yeah thanks for hosting me it was fun yeah thank you <laughs>